The U.S. Ambassador Chris Stevens worked to help rebuild Libya after the revolution. For Secretary of State Hillary Clinton, that only makes his death harder to comprehend. Listen to this. Today, many Americans are asking, indeed, I asked myself, how could this happen? How could this happen in a country we helped liberate, in a city we helped save from destruction? This question reflects just how complicated and at times how confounding the world can be. But we must be clear-eyed even in our grief. This was an attack by a small and savage group, not the people or government of Libya. Uh, during, joining us now is uh, Professor Fuad Ajami. He's the uh, senior fellow at the Hoover Institution. Uh, Professor, thanks very much for coming in. Uh, let me ask you the question that uh, the Secretary of State just asked. How could this happen in a country that Ambassador Stevens helped liberate? You know, Wolf, this region, as you know it so well, is full of heartbreak and full of surprises. And I think Secretary Clinton said it right. When you think of the legacy of Ambassador Stevens going to Benghazi, and when you think of the American effort to protect Benghazi when, when that horrible dictator, Muammar Gaddafi, announced, put, could, put Benghazi on notice that he is on his way to Benghazi to hunt the, the people of Benghazi, to hunt them down house by house, street by street, alleyway by alleyway, as he put it. And then here you have this fine Arabist who devoted his life to this region being gunned down in such a horrible and, and, and just criminal fashion. Horrible indeed. Uh, we don't know who was responsible. Uh, we've heard various speculation. Yes. The chairman of the House Intelligence Committee, Mike Rogers, thinks it has some fingerprints of al-Qaeda, or at least al-Qaeda-inspired affiliated uh, operation. What do you think? You know, Wolf, I think we have to remember that Al-Qaeda had a deep presence, actually, in Libya. And we look, go back to the infiltration of Al-Qaeda into Iraq a while ago, a couple, few years ago. What we learned when the Americans got the documents, the, the uh, computer records of the jihadists, they captured some records, and what they learned was that the largest group of, of jihadists who came into Iraq to kill Americans and to kill Iraqis came from Saudi Arabia. The second largest group, ironically enough, we, didn't, we don't fully remember, the second largest group came from Libya. So there has always been an Al-Qaeda presence in Libya. It was a presence Al-Qaddafi winked at. It was a presence Al that Qaddafi occasionally used in the fashion of the, of the dictators of the Arab world. They could wink at terrorism when it served their purposes. So there is a sustained presence of Al-Qaeda in Libya. I'll ask you the question I asked Chairman Rogers. Uh, coincidence or not that this occurred on the anniversary of 9-11? You know, I think Chairman Rogers was absolutely right. One suspects it was really connected to uh, September 11. And here we are, in fact, we are declaring victory, if you will. I mean, we've been saying, everyone has been making the, you know, reminding ourselves that Osama bin Laden is dead. Osama bin Laden is dead, but bin Ladenism is still alive. And Ayman Zawahiri, his deputy, is still around. And so you do, you have to wonder, why pick that particular date? And I'm not really that, I don't give that much credence to the fact that this was connected to this ridiculous and vile movie that was made about the Prophet. These groups, these kinds of groups look for any incident. They look for the Danish cartoon crisis, they look for, for the, the um, they look for the release of this movie, they look for Whatever uh, Reverend Terry Jones in Florida does, they are never without, any re without reasons uh, to do the, the deeds that they, they do. And what do you make of the mob attack on the United States Embassy in Cairo? And you've been there many times. And the uh, statement that uh, the President, Mohamed Morsi, released today, which did not have one word of condemnation against the, 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 this mob that went in there and burned the American flag. You know, I saw Mohammed Mursi go to Tehran for a meeting, the non-aligned nations. We all watched him when he went to Tehran about 10 days or so ago. And he spoke passionately, condemning the Syrian regime right in front of the Iranians. So he spoke about the Syrian regime and its oppression of the Syrian people. None of that passion, none of that conviction was in that statement. That statement is a disgrace. That statement, I think, is not worthy of an ally. It's not worthy of a country that has been the recipient of American aid for something like 
for, for decades. I think that statement needs, we need to talk to President Morsi about that kind of statement. Are you concerned about the future of U.S.-Egyptian relations? Because as you well know, Fuad, so much is at stake in that relationship. You know, I am, I am. And I think you've asked me, we've talked about this on, 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 on your program uh, many times. Are we now disappointed, if you will, in the, in the Arab Spring and in the rebellion in Egypt, the top of Hassan Mubarak? We should remember, we should remember that indeed much that was wrong came our way during the time of the dictators. We should remember that 9-11, that 9-11 was the gift in many ways of the dictator. When we saw, when we saw Ayman Zawahiri, a Kareen aristocrat in that, in, in that attack on us. When we saw Muhammad Atta, the son of an Egyptian lawyer. So things had been wrong between the United States and Egypt long before the eruption of the Arab Spring. We didn't have a good deal with Hosni Mubarak. But now I think it's easy for people to say, ah, it was better under the, the dictator. It was ter terrible then, and it is terrible today. Should the U.S. Congress continue to appropriate $1.5 billion a year in various forms of military, mostly military, but some economic assistance to Egypt? You know, I haven't really thought about that fully, but I think the time may have come to be brave, to be brave for American foreign policy to risk, if you will, offending the Egyptians and to risk calling this relationship for what it is and to risk going to the Egyptians and asking them for an alliance, for a friendship worth the investment we have in Egypt. We've never done it. We always feared the chaos. We always feared that if somehow or another we pull the plug on the Egyptian military, that all hell would break loose. But we should have more courage. We should expect from the Egyptians themselves a better deal and a better relationship. Fuad Ajami, as usual, thanks very much. Thank you, Wolf. Our national security contributor, Fran Townsend, uh, just saw the U.S. Ambassador, Ambassador Stevens, in Libya only two weeks ago. Her first-hand account of that meeting and the situation in Libya, that's coming up in our next hour.